Welcome, Club 99ers and guests, to the most fun club, the Rotary Club of Little Rock. Just wanted to um, do a shout out for what a beautiful day it is. I just came from the topping out of the new Arkansas Symphony Orchestra Music Center that several of you guys were at, and it was really great to see all the um, people out supporting that and just the activity that's going on in this area. So I'm super glad that our club is part of that. So before we get started today, I'd like to invite Amy Boltz up to this podium to lead us in the five-way test pledge and prayer. Then Jay Barth is going to do guest introductions. And then membership recruitment chair Elizabeth Cloxton is going to introduce us to some new members. Amy? Hello. It's my first time doing this, so thank you for letting me do this. Please join me in sta uh, stating the five-way test. Of the five things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And is it fun? Let us bow our heads for prayer. We ask that you guide and direct our club, its leaders, and our actions. Grant each of us may feel our responsibility to Rotary, to our community, to our country, and indeed to all countries and peoples. Bless our fellowship today and our continued efforts to support our endeavors. Amen. And finally, let's do our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of uh, my colleague Stephanie Street and uh, Dean Vicki Soto and myself, we welcome all our fellow Rotarians to the Clinton Presidential Center as always. Uh, I, I do want to uh, give a special notice to a number of guests that we have in the room. And so if the guests will uh, stand and remain standing, then we'll acknowledge y'all at the end. Um, I realized I walked up here without my glasses, so this will be interesting. Um, First up, uh, Gary Dean, who's a guest of Elizabeth Small. Awesome, thank you, sir. Um, Christy Clark, uh, who's a guest of Jennifer Ronell. Uh, Anna Riggs is also here with Jennifer Ronell. Uh, Buckley O'Mell, uh, here with Jay Chesser. Uh, Ivan Wilson, here with Stacy Wilson. Leanne Jolly, uh, with Mandy Richardson. Also with Mandy is Burke Jolly. Uh, Reggie Ballard is here with Pam Smith. Uh, Martha Greenway is here with Pam Smith. Isaac Smith here with Amy Mines. Uh, Ryder uh, Pierce is here with Matt Buchanan. Uh, Mike uh, Tui is here with uh, Rocky Goodman. And finally, Slater Corbin is here with Molly McNulty. Let's give everybody a hand. Good afternoon, Rotarians. I'm pleased that we have two new members to introduce today. We have Lauren Atkins, and she is sponsored by Emmy Mines. Lauren is the managing director of Haybar Properties, LLC. And for those of you who were here last year and heard her, she was one of our panelists on the com commercial real estate downtown. Um, she is the lead agent for the company's acquisitions and sales, along with overseeing the management of the company's portfolio of commercial properties, mainly in Soma, East Village, and the Argenta areas of downtown Little Rock and North Little Rock. Lauren has a bachelor's degree in marketing and business management from Arkansas Tech University. She is a founding board member of the Commercial Real Estate Council for Metro Little Rock and has served on the City of Little Rock's Historic District Commission. Lauren has served on the board of the Arkansas region of the Make-A-Wish Foundation and was the winner of the Todd Miles Award for Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in 2019. She was featured in Arkansas Business Magazine's Top 20 in the 20s. Lauren and her husband were married last May, so she's also a newlywed. 
For fun, Lauren enjoys reading, cruises, and joy cruises on the golf course, traveling and spending time with family and friends. Please join me in welcoming Lauren to Club 99. So, our next new member is Jean Block, and we are happy to welcome her to Club 99. She is the first female CEO of the Little Rock Water Reclamation Authority and is sponsored by President Natalie Gadotti and past president Sonia Schmidt. Jean has a degree in sociology from UC Berkeley and a Juris Doctorate from the University of Kansas School of Law. Before coming to LRWRA as the CEO, before the, being the CEO, she served for seven and a half years as the Chief Legal Officer overseeing all legal and compliance issues, including contracts, personnel matters, FOIA requests, as well as state and federal government relations efforts. In 2020, Jean founded the organization's employee, research, employee resource group, Women of Water. She serves on the UA Little Rock College of Business Board of Directors, CHI St. Vincent's Board of Directors, and is the first VP of the Arkansas Water and Wastewater Managers Association. Jean has been recognized in Arkansas businesses 40 under 40 and as a Museum of Discovery Spark Star. She's also one of the top 100 women of impact for Arkansas in 2023. She is married to Rodney Block, who we all know from his wonderful performances here. And for fun, Jean enjoys golf, fishing, and hunting. Please enjoy, welcome me, please, well, please help me welcome Jean to Rotary. That's great. Thank you, Amy, Jay, and Elizabeth, and welcome Lauren and Jean. We're so glad to have you in Club 99. So now I'd like to um, invite Pamela Smith up. She's gonna introduce a special guest, and they're gonna make a special announcement for us. So, Pamela. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'll try that again. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. Thank you. We are excited to be here in this space and place. Thank you, President Gadotti, for the opportunity to briefly share some exciting news that you all can have a part in for the Little Rock School District. We all want what's best for kids, as demonstrated by the strong partnerships between Rotary Club 99 and our educational community. Well, now you have an opportunity to have a shared response to shaping the future of our students in our city, our capital city, and we want everybody to be involved. To tell you more about that, I'd like for you to give a nice rotary welcome to Mr. Reggie Ballard, who is our chief of staff, soon to be a fellow Rotarian. I'm putting him on the spot. But at any rate, we want you to give him a nice round of applause as he comes to share more about that and introduce our special guest. Thank you. I had to check my watch and see if it's afternoon, so I can also say good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Smith, for everything that you do for the Little Rock community and also uh, allowing us to come into this space with so many great people, so so many friends and colleagues from, from previous positions, so I'm excited to be here this afternoon. Uh, like she said, my name is Reggie Ballard, I serve as Chief of Staff for the Little Rock School District, and we are in the process of beginning our strategic planning. Um, we are having a series of stakeholder engagement sessions this week um, around our strategic plan. This will be the first round that we're going to have of stakeholder engagement sessions. I will give a small plug out because we're gonna have a government and business session that will be at Willie Hinton tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. If you're available to join us, we would love to have you there. And to give more details about what is gonna happen during those strategic planning sessions, I'm going to invite up Ms. Martha Greenway of Greenway Strategies from Atlanta, Georgia, who is leading our strategic planning efforts for the school district. So Ms. Greenway, can you come up and provide us with a couple of details on what will happen during these strategic planning sessions? Good afternoon. 
It's delightful to be here. Uh, thank you for giving us a few minutes. So I'm Martha Greenway. I'm um, actually joined today by my colleague, Stacy Walker. Stacy will stand up. Um, we have a, a small team that will be supporting this project. Uh, just a little bit about us. We've been in business for over 11 years. We support, support strategy development for social impact organizations. So we've worked with school districts across the United States, also higher education, large metropolitan library systems, community organizations, and statewide collaboratives but always focusing on impacting communities and improving outcomes for children, families, and learners of all ages. So that is really what we are about. The work that we're doing in Little Rock, the strategy development work will actually go between now and around the end of June. Um, we actually began the work in November with a meeting with the school board. We are looking at a lot of data about the past performance and current status of the school district as well as the Little Rocks community. But one of the key things that we will be doing through this process is hearing from community stakeholders. So we just left a high school. We're speaking to students at every high school in the district. But we also want to hear from the community leaders and the parents and those who really understand the issues and dynamics here in this community. So there are several opportunities for you to do that. As Reggie mentioned, there's actually a session um, that will be held tomorrow. But in addition, there is a online survey. So when you exit, there's a flyer that's got some information about how to access the um, survey if you're like me and uh, texting on the phone is not your superpower. Um, you can use the survey link to access it on your computer or a tablet or you can use a QR code and take it on your phone. What we're interested in learning about are people's perceptions of the assets in this Little Rock community to support students and families because we want to capitalize on that. We want to ensure that this strategic plan leverages the things that are happening and the resources that are, are, that are available. This school district cannot the ch change the trajectory for the city students all by itself. So everyone needs to work together, as you well know, because you are here. Um, but we also want to understand the barriers that families and students are facing and ideas that people people have about approaches to improve conditions for children in the community that the school district could implement. So these are the types of questions that are in the survey. We use an iterative stakeholder engagement process in our approach. <clears throat> so this information that we're gathering now in this analysis phase will be used to draft a high-level strategic direction, and then there will be another round of opportunity for community input where you can actually view that and provide feedback either in discussion forums or through an online input opportunity. So we'll be continuing to come back and iterate. As you well know, no community can thrive with, without a well-educated citizenry, citizenry um, and it is everyone's responsibility to ensure that the children in the community have the best opportunity to learn and meet their full potential. And that's what we're all about. So we um, hope that you will join us in this process. We'll be available afterwards if anybody has any specific questions or any ideas that you wanna share with us. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you guys. I hope that um, all of us here, um, we know that we are big supporters of the Little Rock School District, so I hope you guys participate in some of their, um, their community focus groups here and help um, in the health and growth of our city and our school district. So as a quick reminder, don't forget tomorrow's happy hour at the Experience, the new restaurant downtown. It's five to seven, it'll just be a fun time to hang out, get to know each other better, have a drink or two, and, and just network. So um, it should be super fun. So I hope to see you guys there. Another reminder is this is the last week to nominate for our annual business and professional leader of the year. So if you have someone in mind, now is the time to nominate. In your newsletter, there is a link to the form and there's also a link to some more information on past recipients if you want more information on the award itself so definitely if you have questions reach out to Karen or myself we're happy to help you there um, okay, so for our guest, our theme this year is the power of fun. We always have a theme um, each year to, to Club 99, so it's the power of fun. So each week I give a little fun tip for you guys. Today's tip was actually inspired by the member video that you're going to see because this member talks about 
the fact that she doesn't really think she's that fun, but she is, she is fun. But she does talk about like, it's more about the little moments in her life that bring her joy and fun. And that's really important for us to um, all remember as we learn about the power of fun, that it doesn't mean that you have to bungee jump, jump off a building or that you are in a guitar or playing the guitar in a band. Those are kind of big things. It's really, um, you know, these smaller things can be true fun moments too. Now, I would recommend bungee jumping because it really is fun, but you know, we can stick to the smaller things too. So, um, but it is these moments in life that we make room for. And what Catherine Price, the author of The Power of Fun that we've been talking about, calls delight. So it has to do with creating a fun mindset and being open to fun whenever and wherever. So it's being open to being playful, even in little ways that can affect your moment to moment experience and improve your mood. And figuring, figuring out ways to add even teensy bits of playfulness and connection and flow that we've been talking about to your every, everyday activities can even make some of those non-fun activities a little bit more tolerable. We all know um, the song, uh, a spoonful of sugar from Mary Poppins, right? So you remember the line, in every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. You find the fun and snap, the job's a game. So not that scooping up cat litter or cleaning your toilet is going to be real fun, but you get the point. You know, the more you can cultivate a fun mindset in your everyday life, the lighter your everyday will feel. Um, and if anyone can find a fun way to make cleaning a toilet fun, let me know. All right, so Catherine Price has a whole section in the book about seeking delight, which we'll delve into more on another day. But she references this book called The Book of Delights by a poet named Ross Gay. And Ross took a full year and wrote an essay each day about an everyday delight. And we're talking pecans. Um, strong espressos, people who call him sweetie, um, a friend's unabashed use of air quotes, just very ordinary wonders that he writes about. So the point of that, it's to remind us of the small joys and fun that we can overlook because we're all so busy, right? A reminder that the small delights in our everyday can create those really powerful, true fun moments. Um, so Ross's book is gonna be the next book that I check out at Cal's, so don't beat me to the punch but I'm, I'm going to get that one. Um, it's all a reminder that our lives are what we pay attention to. So our lives are what we pay attention to, not our smart. You know, so we don't want it to be the smartphones and the Instagram and the feeds and all the things. If we train ourselves to notice the small delights of every day, the everyday beauty and kindness and amusing absurdities, the things that make us laugh or that we feel really grateful for, we will feel more positive. So if we pay more attention to sources of playful connection and flow, we're going to have more fun. So let's watch today's um, member video. I think you'll like it. I'm Mandy Richardson. I am the publisher of Little Rock Soiree Magazine and the founder of the Women's Leadership Symposiums and Summits that take place in Arkansas and Texas. So I got the dreaded email um, a few weeks ago saying we would like to film you for a member video for Rotary. It did send me down a spiral of trying to ask myself what I did for fun. Even had to go home and ask my kids. like. Mommy has to do a video and what would you say that she does for fun if I asked you what I do for fun and they both just blankly stared at me. So I've obviously got some work to do, but really I truly think like I may not do a lot of fun things, but I try to have fun in everything I do. So I really do love being a mom, really trying to enjoy the small things from making their lunches to those drives that we have to and from school and getting to talk to them. And then I just really, you know, I love, shockingly, looking at magazines, spending time reading. And then I just live this amazing life that allows me to go out into the community and so I get to dress up and go to these great galas and network with people and just feel so blessed to be able to do that and love those evenings. I'm a full-time working mom like so many in the room and have this amazing life and these great kids to take care of and an awesome job. But let's be honest, what I really love to do and what I have the most fun doing 
is sleeping. I love, 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 love to get a good 15 minute <laughs> quick nap in. I love to sleep. So one of the things I found, um, especially since the pandemic, is that uh, Mandy needs some Mandy time to be able to clear my mind, to be able to kind of go somewhere else and not think about anywhere else. And so I've really found a lot of joy and a lot of mental health from working out. And Jolly Bodies is this amazing space that is now open in Little Rock through a studio. I've been working out with them through their digital space and their gym workouts since uh, the pandemic. Really being able to come into this space and have 30 minutes at night where I just kind of zone out and follow what somebody else is telling me to do for 30 minutes. They're telling me how I'm supposed to move my arm and how I'm supposed to do the squat. Um, that for me is really important for me to find that time to be able to push myself physically, but also just have that time to really kind of focus on the graphics on the wall and listen to the weapon the instructor's doing and then leave 30 minutes later feeling good about what I just did, but also just having that amazing mental reset. And so uh, I would encourage you if you've not found that moment for yourself to create that moment for yourself. And while I enjoy doing that for myself, I've also invited my 12 year old daughter to start working out with me in the evenings a couple nights a week. And that's been a really cool for experience for she and I to be working out next to each other, pushing ourselves and having that moment to kind of walk away and share with each other. So I just love it here and love what it's done for me and my life. It's a lot of fun. I love it, Mandy. And a shout out to Leanne and Burke who are here, who own Jolly Bodies. I'm a Jolly Body fan, so I'm just so glad you guys are here. And y'all, I mean, the power of fun, I'm so glad you had them come, Mandy, because they are the power of fun. They are a dynamic duo of fun. So thank y'all for being here for sure. Love it. All right, so I would now like to ask Lisa Farrell to come up. Lisa's gonna introduce our great panelist and um, program today, so Lisa. Uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the opportunity for this panel to appear today. And uh, frankly, I think most of you all know or voted for the panel or, some, uh, or, or had them done some marketing or built something for, for you. Um, our moderator today will be uh, Sharon Talek Vogelpohl. As you know, she is with Magnum Holcomb Partners and has been since 1994. She became a principal in 2005, and then just five short late, uh, years later, she's run in the place, which, if you know Sharon, shouldn't surprise you. And she does work for Verizon, uh, JB Hunt, Walmart, and many, many other um, significant companies in Arkansas. She is one of our own past presidents, the past president of Club 99, and she is the current president of 50 for the Future. Uh, our next uh, panelist is William Clark. He is founder and CEO of Clark Contractors. Uh, his, he's heavily involved in our community, uh, as uh, you all know. I, I just had the pleasure of hearing about his daughter, who's a fourth year med student and is about to get uh, married in April. So he's got a lot going on. Uh, he's also on the corporate board of uh, Simmons First National Bank. Uh, on the uh, Dean's Executive Advisory uh, Board of the Walton School of Business. Too bad I didn't know that earlier when my son was there, um, but my son had a fabulous experience. And he has served and serves on many nonprofit boards, including UAMS and Children's Hospital. He is a former president of 50 for the Future. And John Riggs uh, will also be joining us on the panel. He is the former CEO of uh, J.A. Riggs Tractor. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving in the state legislature when John was a state senator. He was uh, my mentor and a guide for me. Um, so anything good, a tribute to John. Anything not so good, it's because I didn't listen well to him. Um, we are very, he serves on the Early Childhood uh, Task Force for 50 of the future, 50 for the future uh, with us. And frankly, he has been the linchpin because of his extensive, extensive 20, 30 year history of caring for the children of Arkansas and making sure that they have every opportunity uh, possible. So it's my privilege to serve uh, with these uh, three 
uh, panelists today. And the only thing that I will add about myself as a panelist um, is the relevancy to today's program is I am the immediate past president of 50 uh, for the Future, which uh, last year celebrated its 60th anniversary. So if y'all will join. Is this on? It's on, all right. Hello Club 99, it's wonderful to be back and uh, see everyone. We're super excited about the opportunity to be here today and share a little bit about what 50 for the Future uh, has been doing for the past 60 years, but we're gonna emphasize uh, uh, the most recent history probably uh, uh, above all. But before we get started, there is a lot of crossover between these two groups. Uh, so if you are a member, uh, I see one staring me in the face of 50 for the Future, as well as Club 99, if you would please stand and be recognized being with us today. I see Hank. There you go, there you go. I often, I often talk about uh, Little Rock and the Paratio Principle of the 80-20 rule, with which you're familiar, uh, the 80-20 rule, but I always say Little Rock's a 95-5 town. So thanks to each of you for everything you do uh, in the community as a part of Club 99, and again, for having us here today. So Lisa, you presided uh, during our 60th anniversary. Tell us a little bit about some of your reflections coming off that year. So, uh it was a really interesting opportunity to review everything that 50 for the Future has contributed to the community. It started in 1963, as I said, by a gentleman named William Rector, uh, who probably half of this room uh, knows, or, or certainly three quarters of this room have been impacted by his work in the community. And it started with a few folks who are, were committed to economic development and opportunity for C central Arkansas. Of course, as everything evolves, uh, so has 50 for the Future. Um, instead of meeting in people's living rooms now, the first meeting was held in Rhett Tucker Sr.'s uh, living room, our, our Rhett Tucker and Clark Tucker's grandfather. Uh, Rhett, anyway, you get the relation. Uh, so now uh, uh, we meet in uh, conference rooms downtown. And uh, what really surprised me, I knew of 50 when I was uh, young, um, and I'm still young, but <laughs> uh, having turned 60, it was a good time to reflect with 60, uh, with 50 for the future 60th anniversary. But 50 has really been the source of a lot of progress or contribution to progress uh, in uh, central Arkansas. Uh, its role that it has most often played is to provide seed money uh, so that projects can go forward. Oftentimes, uh, it's not the big dollars that are hard to get, it's the little dollars, the, the first initial contribution to write the grant, to do the study, the environmental impact study, um, to figure out how to move something at the port or the airport. And oftentimes no one has funds for that. So those are the types of projects that 50 supports. Um, the priorities of 50 are economic development, public education, and workforce development, public safety, and transportation. So through the years, we have supported things like the Clinton Presidential Library, the Deck Park, uh, lots of opportunities uh, at UALR, uh, community colleges, and we're heavily involved in the academies of Central Arkansas um, that William is about to discuss with you. So in, in, in reflection, it has really surprised me at the number of activities that 50 for the Future has played a role in in central Arkansas. And you can see the whole list of, or not even the whole list, the things that we were able to identify. And you can see it's over 100 projects alone since 1995. Great, thanks Lisa. 
Um, you mentioned Academies of Central Arkansas. When I was invited to join 50 for the Future, we had just completed a strategic planning process, a facilitated strategic planning process, and uh, had prioritized various and sundry projects that we re really take on as signature projects. And the project at that time that the group voted to endorse is the Academies of Central Arkansas program, which serves all of Pulaski schools, including the Little Rock School District. So our education theme here today uh, is, is apropos, and William's gonna tell you a little bit more about our involvement in that and perhaps about how you can get involved. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. Um, so uh, 2018, uh, Jay Cheshire talked to a few of us about uh, this program in Nashville um, that was the, it's called the Ford Next Generation Learning Model uh, that was uh, kind of a brainchild of the Ford Foundation. And the kind of the, I guess the, the short uh, description is uh, you're kind of bringing career education into the schools uh, as opposed to the kind of the, the legacy um, approach of, you know, the kids get on the van or the short bus and they leave school and go to the, you know, the off-site deal to learn how to work on a car engine or, you know, that kind of thing. And a group of us, um, Ronnie Dedman, Patrick Schick, uh, and I um, went with some other uh, chamber staff and uh, uh, people from Little Rock, uh, toured a couple of schools in Nashville, went to the learning session over a couple of days. I think that was about the third trip that Little Rock people had made over there. Um, and we were just really astounded at, at what Nashville had done. Uh, they had moved to this model, and in I think maybe 12 years, uh, their graduation rate had gone from like 56% to 83%. And uh, I think one of the teachers told us that uh, the average age of a gang member went from 21 to 25, which implies there are you know, a lot more people uh, getting in the workforce and uh, building lives. And in uh, these tours were, we literally saw an operating bank branch uh, at a school that had uh, an academy uh, finance, uh, working television studio, uh, obviously Nashville's, you know, big in the entertainment space. Um, and these kids were, you know, putting on uh, television broadcasts uh, in school, uh, doing school announcements, but learning how to operate those things. And it really exposes them to, um, you know, kind of real world things um, that um, are a lot more interesting than reading an American history book. And I apologize for any teachers out there. Um, but um, my mother's one, so I can kind of say that. Um, but uh, it really brings uh, just real world stuff to these kids. And we heard multiple stories from these teachers about how these kids were, you know, starting in the ninth grade, were kind of realizing interest they, they didn't know they had, and it was spurring them on to be better students. So we came back um, and just all fired up, and 50 took um, uh, kind of the lead to uh, provide the seed money to uh, bring the four school districts in Pulaski County together and um, expose them to it, uh, do a marketing plan that uh, Sharon's firm actually uh, headed up. Uh, it was about, a, I think, a total of about a quarter million dollars over two different um, uh, ask, uh, but to get this thing off the ground, and uh, it has been real game changer. I think, you know, anybody that uh, you talk to that's worked in these districts, uh, it has really changed the game. And one of the thing for especially um, business people in the audience you may like to hear, um, I did not, I'd never thought about it myself until, um, until we got into this, but. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you think about, you go to school and you get your textbooks and you, you know, take these classes, but have you ever given thought to like who decides what your kids are learning? or what you learned. And I, I never had until then, I thought, you know, who did decide what book I was, you know, learning Algebra 2 in or whatever. Um, the business community has input into the curriculum that goes into these academies. So uh, one example from Nashville, uh, one of the schools that had a healthcare academy, 
you can actually get in a program and graduate from high school with a certified nursing assistant certificate, uh, which you could go straight into the workforce. And things like that, we're actually preparing kids for something that's going to help businesses, uh, you know, do what they do, help the community, help the kids. And uh, so it's kind of self-serving in a way, but it, it's just incredible what this thing, uh, the, the potential of this program. And like I said, we were kind of the driving force behind it, organizing um, a lot of the town hall meetings, things like that, and uh, provided the, the, uh, the funds to um, kind of educate the public. And it's really taken off and uh, has been great. Absolutely. The Academy's theme is career ready, college ready. So basically giving kids options as they graduate from school, whether they want to have a skill set to go out and go into the workforce immediately or transition into the higher education uh, realm. So it has been a passion project for the group. There's still a lot of work to do, but we're super excited about seeing the implementation of this and it continuing to take off and yield the results um, that they've seen in Nashville. Thank you for your leadership on that, William. John, um, it's also in the, in the realm of education. Uh, one of our most recent initiatives is we formed a task force on the uh, issue of early childhood education. So the predecessor to uh, graduating into the academies. Talk to us about how that got started and where we are with that right now. Um, thanks, Sharon. Um, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, so I'm just gonna... <laughs> I got this 20 minute speech that I wrote and so... <laughs> And um, thank you for having us here. This is my third time to speak to Rotary 99. The first time was with uh, Joel Anderson. We talked about racism in the Lorock School District, Pamela. We're still fighting that battle. Second time was uh, when the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, decision came down on Lakeview, which changed, I thought, was going to change everything in funding for education in Arkansas. It did not. We're still fighting that. And so today I'm going to talk about early childhood education and third time's a charm and this <laughs> one's going to work. So let me give you a little background. Uh, 50's been involved in education um, for as long as uh, 50's been around. Um, We've always thought that doing, making sure that we had the best educational system, whether it was K-12 or higher education, was one of our missions. Lisa, uh, during her tenure as uh, our chairman, president, uh, started looking around and said, you know, early childhood is something that we really ought to be involved in. Uh, she, when I asked her, you know, why did you do this, she sent me some some factoids, and um, most of them have to do with uh, business. Why does a business group want to be involved in this? Now, you know, honestly, a communist, pinko, liberal like myself, this is a great deal, right? Now, those of you who know me, you know, I was a, I'm a diehard Democrat, um, and I can tell you the U.S. Chamber of Commerce I used to call them the Nazis. But here's some figures from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that she sent me. First of all, early childhood education affects everybody in this room. Every single person here is affected by it, whether you know it or not. The Chamber reports that Arkansas employers lose approximately $865 million annually, annually, due to absences because of uh, lack of child care. They also say that the state of Arkansas loses over $200 million in tax revenue because we don't have a productive workforce. And we don't have a productive workforce, why? Because they can't find child care. And then the other, th factoid she sent me was 11% of parents voluntarily left their job because they couldn't find child care. You know, just to make sure you understand this isn't a 
John Riggs' liberal cause. Let me read you some headlines. First, here's one from CBS News Money Watch. I know they're the lying, you know, three channels that don't tell us all the truth, but here was their headlines. As child care costs soar, more parents may have to exit the workforce. Okay, I buy that. Well, if you don't like that news outlet, how about Forbes? All right? You can't say Forbes is a liberal outlet on any kind of media, can you? Here's their headline. Child care, not just a women's issue, an economic issue. That's Forbes. And so just in case you think maybe not all conservatives think this is an issue, let me give you a headline from the Wall Street Journal, all right? Here's what the Wall Street Journal says. Pricey child care is keeping many parents out of the workforce. So you can see this is a business issue. Now, I want to tell you two things, and then I want to end up in asking for your help. I want to, I want to tell you a couple of things you do not know. I want to follow that with some really uncomfortable truths that you won't want to hear, but you need to hear. And then, I guess in honor of uh, your son who's going through seminary, we're going to have an altar call. <laughs> so here are some things you didn't know. Um, there's more brain development by age three than at any other times in a person's life, okay? More brain development by age three. Between the ages of two and five, higher cognitive function development peaks. This part of the brain development is essential to executive function skills such as, and listen to this business folks and community folks, focus, ignoring distractions, prioritizing, organizing and planning, adapting to the unexpected, problem solving, getting along and working as a team, and my favorite, which I failed, keeping our emotions under control. <laughs> Most children spend 11,500 hours in the care of others between eight months and four years. That's more time than they'll spend in the K-12 education system. Here's an interesting fact you probably didn't know. You know, when we talk about child care, particularly here in Little Rock, you know, we think Little Rock School District. Wow, they have these pre-K programs. They're great, had, have had them since the uh, mid 80s. But here's a factoid. The child care market is mostly small business and nonprofits. And guess what percentage of that they make up? 85 to 90 percent. So this is a business, all right? It's not really a public function, it's a business function. So why shouldn't, that's why 50's involved. Now here's some uncomfortable truths you really don't want to know. And our, our uh, task force listened to these things and we scratched our heads and we looked at each other, and uh, one of our members is Dr. Uh, Chad Rogers, and we turned to him, and since he's a child specialist, he said, I'm afraid these are true. Of the estimated 100, 180,000 kids from birth to five in Arkansas, 120,000 are considered economically disadvantaged. 120,000 out of 180,000. Now, I wasn't a math major. I was an English major in college, so I don't do fractions and crap like that, but that sounds kind of high to me. For the 120,000 kids living in poverty or economically disadvantaged, there are only 38,000 child care slots available, leaving a gap of 80,000 kids who aren't getting served. 80,000 
kids in Arkansas. There's a website I looked at not too long ago. Uh, it's here in Arkansas and it, it uh, promotes jobs in Arkansas and specifically jobs in central Arkansas. Here's some of the things I found that people were looking for. Uh, you look, you want to be a barista, Emma? You want to uh, slop coffee to, to all of us at uh, some place? Well, if you'll come down and get trained, we'll pay you 12 to 13 bucks an hour. Sounds okay to me. How about being a customer service rep? All right, you get to talk to people. These folks are looking for customer service reps. They're going to pay between 17 and 20 bucks an hour if you'll come down and you know, I have just a bubbly personality like I don't, and talk to folks. How about telemarketer? Those obnoxious people who call us even on our damn cell phones. They're looking for those 17, 25 an hour to start. All right, you don't like those things. Maybe you just, you like, you like cars. Well, here's one company looking for a van driver. 15 bucks an hour, cool. I could do that. Or, you know, actually, if you're like me and you just don't want to be around any kind of people, you can just do data entry. Uh, starting pay, 17 bucks an hour. Isn't that cool? Guess what the medium income for a child care worker is in Arkansas? $11.60. Now, let me look at you. You want to trust your most precious asset and only pay them $11.60 an hour. But you'll te pay a, a telemarketer $17.25. It's no wonder we have a problem. 35% of child care workers are suffering from depression. Who wouldn't if you're getting less than minimum wage? 42% suffer from food scarcity. Almost half of the child care workers don't know where their next food new meal is coming from. Think about that. Now, aren't those pretty uncomfortable truths? I mean, I didn't want to hear them. Still don't want to hear them. Even when I, today, when I say them, I think, damn, what the hell is wrong with us? So, let's talk about fixes. To fix this problem, and I'll end up here, Sharon, so you don't have to chew me off the stage. We're going to have to do a few things. We're going to have to do some policy changes. We're going to have to have legislative fixes. And we're going to have to have that dreaded word, revenue enhancement. Our task force found some solutions as we were looking at these problems. And we found these solutions in the South that other states were doing. In Louisiana, for in instance, they have, uh, for the past 10 years, they're offering tax credits for uh, people in child care workforce, for those businesses in child care, and for those families. It's been fairly successful. In uh, Virginia, they used all of their COVID funds to enhance child care. They ramped it up. Uh, an incredible amount, and now they're trying to figure out how to make it ongoing. In Kentucky, they passed a law that said if you're a child care worker, your child gets free tuition. So there are examples here in the South of what we can do. And lastly, we joined a coalition, uh, 50 for the Future, called Excel by Eight. Uh, the coalition is made up of uh, Nonprofits, uh, but most of its members are either business organizations like 50 for the Future, the Northwest Arkansas Council, the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Little Rock Chamber of Commerce, Jay, thank you, uh, individual businesses like Lisa's, um, and then chambers across the state. Uh, and then lastly, it's made up of um, of uh, some of our uh, higher education institutes. And Summer DePaul is here from UA Plasky Tech. 
who was on our task force. Thank you, Summer, for the first one to sign up. I hope you're one of very many. And so the, the goal of this coalition is um, to put forth public policy, a public policy agenda that is designed by the coalition members, not by the politicians, and I'm a recovering politician, as is Lisa, not designed by them, but by the coalition members, and that has solutions that will benefit coalition members. And so, um, lastly, uh, you can see up here the little skew or whatever the hell they call those things. QR code. Okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I was a tractor salesman. We didn't have those. You can join Excel by eight. Now, let me tell you, when you join, it's a great organization. Here's the first thing. They don't want your money. Okay? Keep your money in your pocket. They don't want you to come up here and make a fool of themselves like I do. They don't want you to have to go talk to your employees about this. All they want is your logo and your support to do something about early childhood education. Take a picture of it and join today. It's important. We don't have much time. We've got to get all this done by the 2025 session. And so we've got a year. And that's not much time in putting together policy. So thanks, Sharon. You bet, John. Thank you. It's a wonderful thing when you have folks that are passionate about issues coming together to do this. So I would encourage you to learn more about Excel by 8. There's also very specific opportunities and plentiful opportunities at varying levels to get involved with the academies of Central Arkansas, even if it's just visiting with a teacher about your industry and the types of skills that you're looking to hire. It can be as simple as that. And there's enormous opportunity there. And you can learn more about that through academies of Central Arkansas.org. Org. Just want to touch on a couple of other uh, initiatives that 50 has been involved in just to show the breadth of that. Lisa, tell us briefly about the Dollar General project uh, dealing with food deserts. I know Hank is here with us. Yeah. So uh, two or three years ago, 50 uh, put together a task force to address uh, several issues around equity. Uh, things in One of those issues was food desert. There were actually other issues as well. And Hugh McDonald, uh, who is uh, currently serving as head of the Department of Commerce, he chaired the committee that focused on resolution of food deserts. And eventually, they, there was the, no fix is easy. So I'm going to tell you the fix. And you're going to think, oh, yeah, it took a while to get there. Um, but the committee, uh, along with uh, city leaders and Buckley and Jay and others, um, worked with Dollar General to create ten, to convert 10 of their stores uh, to have fresh produce uh, and I'll call it healthy uh, grocery options because many, many neighborhoods, Dollar General or the equivalent is their source of groceries. And so by putting in fresh produce, dairy, eggs, et cetera, uh, it enabled them to have uh, access uh, to a healthier, more nutritious um, choices. Outstanding, outstanding. Then in the in the realm of economic development, we've got a couple of things that have been ongoing. William, briefly about the Port of Little Rock super site, because I want to make sure we leave them enough time for questions. I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> so every airport has a, uh, an antenna, special antenna that directs air traffic uh, called a VOR cone, and yeah. um, they're pretty important. You obviously need one. Um, ours uh, has been located in the Riverport area for... Um, I don't know, 50 years or something. Um, and it basically stopped the uh, ability of the port to expand, uh, which, you know, everybody knows has been a big job creator. So the chamber got behind um, relocating the cone, which uh, it is now, uh, I guess, under construction right now off site. What that's going to allow the port to do is create a super site. A uh, super site um, is a about a thousand acres, but it's what that means is big enough to have like a, a vehicle assembly plant 
type. It's that big. And uh, to make that happen, um, you have to do quite a number of studies, geotechnical surveys, et cetera. And 50 funded about a $90,000 study uh, that just got wrapped up to put those things together. Uh, and just to put it in perspective, that's 5% of the economic uh, development budget for the chamber every year, which is too much for them. So 50 steps in that void and does things like that. And um, hopefully big things in store at the port because of that. Absolutely, absolutely. And then lastly, I'll quickly mention, we also have been similarly involved in the 30 Crossing Deck Park and the pedestrian friendliness. Uh, you could see some of that construction going on out the window. So I wanted to make t uh, sure we save time for questions. So at this time, we will entertain any questions. And uh, Amy is going to bring the mic around. So she asked that folks wait. The new VR cone has no glass in it, Courtney. <laughs> uh, I'm an aspiring pilot, so I'm glad to hear that's moving anyways. Uh, no, my question is, so we're hearing the big picture and what we're doing. What are some of the first steps we're working on right now that this group can get involved in? I was looking at the Excel for eight, how you could reach out and, and put your voice behind these. But what can we do action wise today going forward that we can help 50 for the future get some of these things done? So um, the uh, I'll, I'll take a bit of early childhood and then I'll defer to Sharon. But to, to me, uh, early childhood, there's really a, a need not just for the children to be in care, but given that cognitive development, which frankly I did not know, um, uh, it needs to be quality care. And so be looking for solutions from other states. Uh, we are recognized that they need to be business friendly, so tax credits, um, uh, ways to encourage uh, wages to increase and additional training through this uh, education. So uh, truthfully, I would say join Excel by eight and be ready when the legislative session comes to work on business friendly um, solutions that can be passed. I know we just did the Learns Act and it require it calls for early childhood education and now we need to put that into context. And to me, the fact that, as John mentioned, the U.S. Chamber, the Arkansas State Chamber and chambers throughout the state, Northwest Arkansas Council are involved, that shows that it's really a business issue. And if each of you in your, this room can think about how many times have you had an employee call in sick, because there was nowhere for good quality childcare, they lose their sitter. I know that when we had small children, I dialed back my time joyfully and happily, but it also uh, impacted my work. I mean, we all know that it, that it is a significant issue, but to me, the greater significance is the quality of the childcare. Other questions? Hey, Stacy. Hey, thank you all for your work. About how long did it take in Nashville for the academies type program to bear fruit? Well, I believe in 2018 when we went, it had been in place, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, 13 years? Yeah, so it's been in place for about 18 years. Um, the numbers on like the graduation rate was uh, 13 years old at the time. Um, but I, I, I mean, they had, it was so impressive. The ambassadors, when we got off the bus, met us at, at the curb with little blazers on, with their little you know school crest, and uh, walked us in the school. Um, you know they're teaching them um, just adult you know manners, soft skills. Talk about soft skills a lot. And uh, these kids were were great, and they were just barely over a decade in at the time. Great, thank you. Could I just add a quick thing? I'm sorry, I, yes, I, I don't mean to hijack, but that's why your question, to your question about what can we do right now, part of the conversation extends into the Little Rock community and that's what, this is timely. So we encourage you to lend your voice to the effort to support students within the greater Little Rock community by participating in our strategic planning session. So you can do that right now, thank you. <laughs> All right, I know it's important to get out of here by one. I've been in Natalie's shoes, so I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon, Lisa, William, and John. Um, 
little shout out leadership uh, class 16 here. William, Sharon, myself, let's go. Um, the, best class. the best class for sure. <laughs> So um, thank you guys so much. We're excited to see the continued mark that 50 uh, for the Future is going to make on the city, as I know you guys will. Um, before we head out, and I'll give these to you in a minute, um, we've got a little special gift for you for your um, desks. It features our mural that we um, commissioned for the River Market. Just a little bit of um, reminder that Little Rock's big on fun, and it's, it's a great uh, tie into our power of fun. So thank you guys again. Um, as a reminder, uh, happy hour tomorrow at the experience five to seven. Hope to see you there. If you've got somebody in mind for the business and professional leader of the year, definitely now's the time to send us that nomination. Thank you. And not to be missed next week, we're going to have a super fun program. It's all about movies and the Academy Award predictions with Michael Cook and Keith Gerlington. It's going to be super fun. Chris Mangum is going to moderate that for us. So we'll be a fun one week at Rotary. So thank you and we'll see you next week. Yes, let's get a picture.